I'm Maurício Manhães, and this is the Service Design Show. Welcome to your two weekly service design update, where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently doing. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and the challenges up ahead. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer so you can make a bigger impact on the world around us. We bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe to the channel. My guest in this episode is Mauricio Menes. Mauricio is currently a professor at SCAD. Uh, he's also involved with LiveWork and he's been traveling all around the world doing service design. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like who are service designers and what are the three fundamental pillars. We'll talk about why service design makes sense from a business economic cycle perspective. And finally, we'll also talk about service dominant logic and how it has the power to transform the way we see service design. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. So let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Mauricio. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Ma Mauricio, you have a long history in, uh, in uh, service design. You have an interesting background. And I'm really curious, do you actually recall your very first memory that you got in touch with service design? Yes, uh, it was 2008 uh, and I was working on, on an IT company and at some point the way we were developing software at that, at that time it wasn't working and I tried to figure out how to how, how could I solve this how could I involve the users in a better way and actually researching on the web I found out uh, serv the service design network and um, right away, I got, I got in contact with Birgit Mager. She mm -hmm. was really uh, welcoming. So this, it's, that's how everything started. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back in 2010, there was also the period that uh, actually the first service design network conference was in Amsterdam. Yeah, 2008. Yeah. 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 Were you there in 2008? No, 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 <laughs> I wasn't, uh, unfortunately. But since then, I've been to most of them. Uh, yeah. All right, so you've um, handed me three topics that we can discuss in this episode and all three, uh, like we said, we can talk for hours, but we need to keep it short. And for the people who haven't seen any of the previous episodes, I have your three topics here on a paper and you also have uh, a few papers containing question starters, right? Yeah. All right, so I'll, uh, I'll pick one of your topics and I'll invite you to pick up a question starter and then uh, we'll talk about this topic, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So let's start um, with this topic, Mauricio. It's a topic called three pillars. Do you have a question starter and can you hold it up? Yeah. It goes along um, with this one. The three pillars of service design, I would choose who are service designers? Explain. Uh, um, we have here at SCAD a lot of uh, contact from uh, companies uh, wanting to know how they hire service design, how, what would they, how would they assess these candidates, how, uh, what they would expect from them. And actually, to be able to respond to their uh, curiosity or need, um, we end up developing three pillars. So to help them, uh, mostly HR people, uh, to understand what service designs, service designers are and what to expect from them. All right. So uh, one of the pillars is um, understanding stakeholders. The first one, understanding stakeholders. The second one would be developing innovative opportunities. And the third one would be understanding institutional transitions. Uh, of course, we end up developing a whole way to... Uh, assess and explain these three pillars, but basically is a uh, service designer should be able to understand stakeholders, uh, both from a qualitative 
and the quantitative perspective, being able to assess these uh, stakeholders in a meaningful way. So they know the now, what's right. Right. at stake now. Uh, the second one would be developing innovative opportunities. Therefore, is uh, the whole design, co-creation, creativity, well, methods. We see in the textbooks, and, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the third one is to understand how to move from A to B. So A would be uh, the stakeholders now. B would be these innovative opportunities. And a service design should be able to, to know how to get from A to B in the most uh, effective and sensible way. And, and, um, and the last uh, pillar that you describe um, seems like, a, all three seem like an important one, but I, um, I can imagine people uh, ask you the question, is the third pillar really a part of service design? Because it sounds like change management and transitioning organizations. Do you believe that this should be a core skill of service designers? Yeah, if we understand uh, design and service design as a way to augment the potential to act of people and uh, stakeholders, for instance, uh, service designers should be uh, able, at least, to understand the challenges of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, at some point, it's really easy, let's say, to create innovative opportunities. But making this transition from A to B is not very, um, or it's not as simple as it seems. And uh, being able to understand this may uh, set the standard for a good performance uh, service designer. Good, so uh, uh, how do the HR people respond uh, that you've presented these three pillars to? Yeah, actually those three pillars are were developed uh, in, in, in a partnership with several companies and HR people. So it's kind of a, a language that they are at least being um, uh, accustomed to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been useful. They, they really enjoy. So uh, we break down those three pillars in how to assess uh, a better uh, definition of what implies each one of them so uh, it helps them uh, better picture uh, both the candidate and the employee that uh, is supposed to develop service design in an organization. What, what do you find the most interesting uh, about these three pillars or what are the things that you are thinking about the next steps? Uh, I guess the next step is, is exactly what you just uh, asked is like how to turn these three pillars and, and the whole explanation about them and how to assess them in a, in a turn this into a more easy and uh, accessible way. So deliver to, to, to companies a, a, a common understanding of uh, how to assess and um, uh, evaluate even the service designers from this uh, uh, three pillars perspective. Do, do you see also students using uh, these, this terminology to explain at home what they do? Yes, 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 for sure. And then they use a very much, uh, a much more simple way to, to, to explain this to their parents. It's uh, quite nice to, to hear them uh, like echoing this to, to their parents, it's interesting, yeah. For, for uh, the people who want to learn more about this, is there any documentation, literature, presentations? Oh, or should unfortunately. They, should they just go to SCAD and, uh, and uh, study with you? Yeah, so far it's, a, it's an internal document. Right. Uh, uh, our students have access, we have access, our partners in industry have access to this, but it's not yet been released as a public document, but uh, it will be soon. Uh, let's use this, uh, the comments in this video to start a discussion about this. That's, uh, we'll yeah, see yes, what happens. Yes. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like discussions. So, <laughs> so uh, Mauricio, let's move on uh, to the second topic. Um, and um, it's quite a different one. And this second topic, it's called the 
economic business cycle. Yes. Yes. And, and, do you and, have uh, a question um, started that goes along with this one? Yeah, it's the why service design from an economic business cycle uh, perspective. So uh, the, the, the thing first here, question, Mauricio, what do you mean with the economic business cycle? Let's clear that up. <laughs> okay, the economic business cycle, uh, as defined by Schumpeter in the 20s of the last century, is uh, the dynamic that occurs from innovation, so something, a new product or, or um, a new way of doing things is created. It creates value, profit. At, at some point, it becomes routine. It's copied, so the laggers come in, start, and, and then profits dries, and it ends, uh, usually ends in a crisis. <laughs> so though this wave, yeah. this economic wave that we've seen all over uh, uh, the world is said, or its name was named by Schumpeter as the economic business cycle. Mm -hmm. And it has two uh, major, if I can uh, summarize the, the, the economic business cycle is, one is the, what Schumpeter calls brain activity phase, yep. and I yep. call the, the, the design phase. And another one is the routine phase. So creating routines that, uh, so the whole efficiency uh, 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 process that drives uh, uh, profit and, and, and mass, mass produce products. So those two uh, phases, uh, we've been seeing uh, from the, I don't know, the last 60 years, a shorten of the routine phase. It's, it, it be, it's becoming easier and easier to produce, mass produce products and uh, figure out routines to make them uh, efficient. Uh, thanks to the engineering and management uh, researchers and mm -hmm. practitioners, mm -hmm. it, it became really easy. At some point, uh, you, you have uh, companies today that are just focused on the design part, the brain activity, and just outsource the, the, the production and management to, to third parties or China, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, the funny thing is that although the routine part has shorten the design part because it's always the new uh, trying out new things haven't hasn't so it's it seems to to uh, I don't know the layman let's say that the design is getting um, uh, more attention but it's it's just because the the other part is being sorted out in a way that it's it's been easier and easier to routinize things. So what you're saying basically is that design isn't becoming bigger or more important. Uh, it's just the other part, the routine part is getting smaller. And that's why we all believe as being yeah. in the design industry that we are getting more important. But yeah, it's, the, then, it's the other way around. The, the other industry yes. is getting smaller. Yes. Yeah. Or, or efficient yeah. uh, in a sense that it's been really, yeah. it's becoming really easy to routinize things. So, uh, and uh, also, uh, what he proposed and then the service dominant logic reinforces is the, that service, uh, as uh, Bastia said in, in 1800, is the begin, the middle and the end of the economic cycle. So this cycle is basically a service life cycle. So being in service design at this moment when uh, the, the routine part gets shortened, it's an awesome opportunity. Like, um, so then we started with the question, how does service design fit in into the economic business cycle? How would you summarize that? So the economic, business economic cycle is basically a service design cycle. You create something, you try to routinize this, to implement this, and you drive all uh, uh, the, the value that it can uh, create. Um, at some point, it's so uh, used or, or drawn, the whole, the values is like uh, 
drawn from it that it dries out and you have to start again. So basically it's what service designers do. Designers do at large, but service designers are more focused on the core of the economic business cycle, which is service. And what, what, what is the thing that excites you the most about this topic? Because you seem to be excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, I know it's not, it, it might not seem sexy, but from a, a consistent perspective, like uh, if, if you need to have a strong theoretical background to support what service designers do, it's just perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the father of innovation, uh, all the way through um, uh, service dominant logic today, points uh, clearly towards service design. At, at, at some point, it's, uh, it's possible to, to say that uh, even companies that don't know service design, they must be doing service design, although not the, in the better way, but there's no way because they are part of the economic cycle. Economic business cycle, yeah. Mm. And everything is service, so they are. Uh, and nowadays, the the with the uh, prominent uh, design role in the economics in economic business cycle, they they cannot help but do service design. Mm. They might be doing wrong mm. or badly, let's say. Yeah. But they are. They they can't. Um, do anything else but service design. And, and then, um, do you have a question around this topic? What is the thing that you're trying to figure out? Or is this all yeah, spe again, specifically to this topic, right? Yeah, again, it's, uh, I, I guess I have, a, as, a, as a professor of service design, my main question, how, it's always how to get this message across. Right. How to transform this in a in a way in a narrative that augments the potential to act of people. Like mm. when they hear, they say, "Aha! Oh, now I can I, I understand what's happening." Mm. That that's always my 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 main concern is how to to get this very dry and theoretical. Uh, uh, and, and from my perspective, awesome uh, 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 theories to the to the people and enable them to act better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's my main question all the time. So how to get the message across? Yeah. That should be a, a thing that the designers and service designers should be good at. So uh, yeah. it shouldn't take too much time. Yeah. Um, Mauricio, we're moving on because uh, uh, time is flying by and I have the uh, third topic and it's, uh, um, yeah, again, a cryptic one, maybe one of the <laughs> most cryptic ones we've had on the show so far. And it's the SDL XNM number five. So service design logic XNM number five. And do you have a question started that goes along with that one? Yeah, Mark, this is the, uh, for me, it's a very dear one, and I say, how can we define service design from the service dominant logic perspective? Uh, yeah, service dominant logic, axiom number five. How can we use that <laughs> to define service design? Yeah, uh, again, that's not a very sexy thing, but uh, actually, it enables us to define service design in a very consistent way. Uh, just let me say something first we all know that service design has many definitions like it's uh, uh, i i don't think that uh, one definition would uh, be correct over others but um this one especially because it come it comes from a a very good body of knowledge that's been involving uh throughout the years uh the service dominant logic and uh, at some point, uh, the service dominant logic proposed five axioms. So it's kind of uh, not uh, easily question five sentences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fifth one, uh, when I read for the first time, was like a uh, uh, very good surprise for me, which is the, the I'll read it. 
is value co-creation is coordinated through actor-generated institutions and institutional arrangements. Not sexy at all, <laughs> but when you read, you say, okay, value co-creation is a product of a coordination of institution. Mm -hmm. So at some point to create value, to co-create value, someone, something must coordinate institutions. So when you think of going to a restaurant, there's an institution called restaurant, there's an institution called uh, waiter, there's an institution called uh, food, uh, all the expectations uh, that evolve around those institutions, someone has to coordinate them. And uh, from a service design perspective, that is actually what we do. Right, right. Yeah, right. We, we have like, okay, we have to create a new, I don't know, insurance uh, service. So there's a, you have to understand the institution and, and not the organization, the, the institution insurance, what people expect from it, uh, what values can be created from it. And then you have to coordinate this and at some point design new arrangements. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, Although, again, it's not a message that uh, get across easily from an academic, let's say, and, and mostly a theoretical perspective, it defines, in a way, uh, service design that it's very, very helpful to drive further research, to drive uh, more friendly uh, discussions and definitions of service design. What, what do you mean with more friendly? Instead of saying like value co-creation is coordinated through actor-generated institution institutional oh, right. arrangements, yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you would say like uh, service design uh, is a way to um, create, and, 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 and I, I like to stress this, uh, to create new forms of augmenting people's potential to act. So when you create a new service, uh, your concern or you should be concerned about all the, the stakeholders, not only the service uh, uh, provider or, or the, the customer, but all involved uh, uh, stakeholders into augmenting their potential to act, which is uh, creating value. And, and do you see this domain of service dominant logic as something that we as service designers should know more about and explore more? Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Actually, it's, it's uh, uh, nowadays uh, the first paper that was published on 2004 uh, by Professor Varga and Robert, Robert Lush. Um, it's the most cited academic paper of the century. So. Either you right. like, yeah, yeah, the, we have like 16 years only, but uh, uh, it's, it's nowadays the most cited paper. So, uh, uh, as I always say, you can hate or love service design, uh, service dominant logic. There's no problem. What you can't do by now is not knowing hmm. service dominant logic. It's, it's uh, a very consistent open-ended uh, uh, body of work, constantly evolving. So it's not the, the it's not gospel. Mm. It can be review, revised, on, and, and, and changed uh, as it evolves. And uh, and actually, this is the the main force behind service terminal logic is this uh, not uh, uh, and that they. The, the whole body and the whole uh, researchers involved, they they are not professing a faith. This is it's it's a work that's evolving. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a perspective on service that it's really really interesting. So, if you would have to point somebody uh, who wants to learn more about this, what is the first research that you would say they uh, need to to look up? Uh, the actual papers that uh, explain the service dominant logic are quite dry and mm -hmm. very academic. 
but uh, I've I've been writing or trying to 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 translate this for a very day to day uh, language. So I have got a couple of uh, uh, texts about this uh, published. But anyway, Google it. Google uh, service dominant logic and. Uh, and you find amazing things. Uh, cool. f- for a service designer, I guess, uh, at least I, I, I tell this to, to my students, you can't not know this. You and, just can't. And I must be honest, so far we've done 20 episodes, nobody has mentioned this before. So that's, yeah. quite, that's quite interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's how academia things evolve. So it was the first time it was published was in 2004. So in terms of uh, writing about service design, there's a very sharp rupture in 2004. Papers before 2004 are considered old. Mm. They, they are so, uh, and, and papers that don't cite serve the dominant logic. Either way, so even uh, uh, either uh, uh, supporting or criticizing or being against certain logic, today they don't. I, I have, uh, for instance, I have a lot of uh, uh, contacts. I, I receive a lot of contacts from students all over the, wor- the world uh, to discuss about their research uh, project, master, and, and PhD projects. And the first thing that I ask them is Have you read Serves Dublin Logic uh, papers? If they didn't, I ask them to first read and then we can talk. Because if you didn't read this, there's not yeah. much we can discuss about. I, I think you're giving a lot of viewers homework, uh, Mauricio. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, so, I'm, a, I'm a professor. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, it's, it's interesting to know that there's such an amazing pocket body of knowledge that we can tap, in, uh, tap into. Yeah. Um, Mauricio. Final question for now. I, I'm sure um, that you have questions that you want to figure out yourself, and you already touched upon that you are thinking every day about how to spread this to a broader audience. Is that the main question you have, or is there something else you'd like to ask the viewers who are or viewing or listening this episode? Yeah, I guess my, my main concern now is how to get this message across. There are valid consistent and meaningful theories that could support our work. They are there, mature, it's hanging, low hanging fruits. And uh, uh, I see a lot of discussions going on in the service design world that uh, they are old now, by now. Those theories could jump us ahead like 10 years. And there's still discussions about those not most, but a lot of the issues that we discuss in the service design world, world were already solved by research. We just have to, okay, this is it. Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's talk about something else. It's like the uh, saying that uh, service design should be human-centered. Uh, we destroy our planet by being human-centered. So we... we Service design should be holistic, not centered at all. Should be a, a very 360 degree perspective. It's not just the human that's there. Should be a lot more uh, holistic, and that's why I, I always uh, uh, teach and try to 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 get my my students uh, very comfortable and knowledgeable about ambiguity. So how can we jump into a context and be uh, effective by dealing and, and, and perceiving this context as ambiguous as possible and drive value from this instead of trying to uh, fight ambiguity uh, right. exactly the other way around, right. like drive value from this ambiguity. So, the, the, and just to summarize this, if people uh, want to help you out, it's especially about how to spread this message across through the, yeah. the service design community and maybe even in a broader community, right? 
Yes, yes, in a lot, not even uh, repeating what I said, but translating what I said. Right, so making okay, it accessible. Yeah, making it accessible. Okay, I got you, Mauricio. Oh, th <laughs> this, but that should be said, or the message should, should be that way to, to be more meaningful to, to a broader right. audience. I, hopefully some people will pick up the uh, the gloves and start working on it, chewing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's one of my uh, <laughs> main uh, desires by being uh, uh, at your show. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So, Mauricio, uh, thanks for your time. I, I I have the feeling that we have much more to discuss, but uh, we we scratched the surface. And uh, again, thanks for making the time and sharing your your thoughts. Yeah, Mark, it was my pleasure. Let's uh, completely thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, this is the Service Design Show.